Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm your moderator for today's session. Um, generally, when we're an intimate group like this, uh, I keep my moderation pretty darn light. Um, Catalina, Stephanie, uh, if you would prefer in the interest of informality to introduce yourselves, that's fine. If you'd like a formal introduction, I'm happy to introduce you, whatever you guys prefer. It just sometimes it, it adds a degree of formality that feels a little silly based on the intimacy and size of the group. Um, but I'm happy to do it. We've had some speakers who really enjoy it. So um, you you get very unfiltered me uh, and you get an introduction. So uh, I think that's on the balance of minus. Uh, uh, we are, again, we appreciate everybody being here. We appreciate everybody setting the intention to try to attend as many of these uh, through the tale of winter and spring. Uh, Stephanie, I love your wintry background. Uh, mine is just blurry because uh, what's not shown is all of the chaos of the end of the holidays. I hope that everyone had a good holiday season and a uh, festive start to the new year. And with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie and Catalina, whichever of you would like to go first to do a brief introduction and then we'll launch into your content. Yeah, I'm back to um... And Catalina, um, do you want to put up the slides? Um, I don't think I have the version that you had just edited. Um, but yeah, totally, totally feel um, what you're saying. And yeah, you don't want to see what's actually going on at my house. I'm working from home today, so that's where I have the very nice background. But I'm Steph Garber, and um, I apologize for my voice. I got like the 10th daycare virus of the, the year from my son. I'm so sick over New Year's and just getting my voice back. But I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Brown. Um, I was in your shoes not that long ago. I was a fellow with my co-fellow Catalina um, at Brown, and I stayed at Brown as a faculty um, member, and I'm now the associate um, director of our division. It's really great to be here with all of you um, and to be starting off the new year with this talk. Um, Catalina and I have given this talk you know, in previous years, and each year it kind of continues to evolve as the decolonizing global health movement also evolves and changes. And and I think what's exciting is that we're now seeing a lot more action, um, whereas at kind of the beginning, it was just a lot of talk about like, what's wrong, what's wrong. And now hopefully we're making um, slow, but real um, and meaningful steps towards actual change. And we'll talk about that. But I think um, today's a short session. So we really actually wanted this to be um, as much discussion for you to understand your own perspectives on what decolonization is and what it means for you and your work. Um, but also for you to learn from each other, because, you know, I definitely by no means consider myself an expert on decolonization. It is a huge topic and I learn about more about it every day. Um, so we hope to just spend as much time as possible on the discussion. And um, I'll turn it over to you, Kathleen, for your introduction. Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Catalina Gonzalez Marquez. It's nice to see some familiar faces. So hi, Paul. Hi, Malika. And so, yeah, so I was a former fellow at uh, Brown and unfortunately left. But um, and now up the street at Harvard, um, I'm actually based more in humanitarian work. So I'm um, the associate director for emergency health systems at Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Um, I'm also a clinical instructor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, but yeah, this is something that has been a very personal and deep interest of me of mine for a very, very long time. Um, I do more of it in the humanitarian aid sector in the humanitarian sphere and um, Paul has heard a similar lecture um, at the ATRIC course. Um, but really glad to be sharing this with all of you. For the sake of time, um, I want to kind of just get started because we do um, have an interactive and discussion section towards the end that I hope that we get to. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back over to Steph so that we can get started. All right, um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so just a few ground rules that we like to start with all of our talks. So just um, make sure that we all come from a place of respect for each other and also just understanding that we all possess positions of power and privilege. And also we are um, in positions where we sometimes lack power and privilege. Um, and there's might be some terms that we use. Um, so ask for clarification if you're not sure about anything. And then um, just be you know uh, mindful that you know we are you know, we try as hard as we can to not be biased, but both of us are um, academic um, emergency physicians who are practicing primarily in high income countries at um, academic Ivy League institutions, actually both of us. So there's definitely a lot of bias there. And as uh, yeah, and as um, Bhakti said, um, definitely during the discussion or at any part, if people think it would um, be better to um, have more open discussion, we can kind of stop the 
be um, recording at that point. Next slide. Um, so this is um, just a statement from uh, um, a, a family medicine doctor and wonderful advocate for decolonization that um, Kathleen and I have had the privilege of being on a panel within the process. I'll just read this um, to try to start us off. Decolonization has multiple definitions and that's okay. The complexity of the concept process and movement allows it to accommodate multiple definitions, even as its meaning shifts depending on the socio-political positionality of the actor, the positionality of their audience, the actor's geographical and epistemological location, their colonial history, their role inside or outside academia, activism, politics, and their access to power. It is a colonial construct that everything has to be rigidly defined and have only one definition. The fluidity of decoloniality allows for a multifaceted approach to decolonization so that various aspects of the colonial mountain could be attacked simultaneously and synchronously, increasing the likelihood of it being successfully leveled. That statement just says so much. Um, Ioma is just like a, a, a force of nature. Um, definitely, if you are interested in hearing more of her talks, she's given a lot of webinars um, through Consortium of Universities for Global Health, um, their conferences, and um, she's also published on this. So she is so eloquent, um, so definitely someone to put on your reading list. Next slide. So what do we mean when we talk about decolonization? So we always need to kind of start back and look a little bit at the history so we can just all be on the same um, uh, on the same uh, starting point when we have an understanding. So colonization really means to settle among and establish control over, to dominate. The fundamental part of colonization was to remove power from the colonized, dispossess and transfer resources, including knowledge, language, culture, in the name of progress or civility. And colonial medicine specifically was a critical element of the colonial machine um, and part of what made imperialism of many of the European um, colonizing powers so successful when they colonized many different countries throughout Asia, Africa, and America. And it was primarily concerned with protecting European health so that they could continue their um, imperial uh, manifesto. Um, it helped them maintain military superiority in term, in many instances was the key um, deciding element that um, ensured that the military forces were able to conquer other peoples. Um, and it supported extractive industries in terms of economic powers of, you know, um, much of, you know, why today's um, leading uh, um, economic forces in the world are so powerful is because of these um, bases on extractive industries, including the trade uh, of slaves um, of ivory, sugar, cotton, rubber, and tea. And then talking about the actual medicine part of it in terms of epidemiology, um, there was a very narrow bacteriological approach um, or virological approach to infectious disease control. Um, so not so diseases that have been historically called neglected tropical diseases. You know, these are not neglected tropical diseases for the people, the many millions of people that have um, things like schistosomiasis, like they're called neglected because they're neglected by the historically European colonial um, uh, uh, powers that kind of created the, the, the structure of colonial medicine. So they were interested in the diseases that would affect people that were settlers or colonists, um, like malaria and yellow fever. And this is just a picture just to kind of remind ourselves all of how present um, the colonial um, framework still is today. So this is actually a picture um, from a, just a few years ago of the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and Gorgas. Um, you know, many of you have heard or even possibly even taken the Gorgas course in Peru, which is on um, a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. And um, many people may not know, but this is a publication from um, of, of Gorgas, and it was called, um, this in what is today the New England Journal of Medicine, it's called the Boston Medical Surgical Journal, called The Conquest of the Tropics for the White Race. And this was a, this was not, um, you know, subtle, this was very explicit. Um, and this might be, not be something that is always talked about. It wasn't talked about until maybe, you know, five years ago, or, you know, th whatever, three years ago, when kind of decolonizing global health really took off and became this kind of bad word and it was the, the word of the day for, for so much of global health that some of this came out. But, you know, five, 10 years ago, um, when I start, like was, you know, 
starting like as a resident and then as a fellow, this was not not being talked about on a daily basis. This wasn't a part of, you know, um, GEMFC type type lectures. Um, so it's really important for us to just always keep in mind that that's that's our part of our history. So um, this is very simplified, but this is kind of a nice thing that we like to go over is this idea. So this was in BMJ Global Health, which also is somewhat colonial in some ways, but has improved in many ways in recent years. Um, Global Health 1.0 was really tropical medicine, which is concerned with quite keeping white men alive in the tropics. Um, Global Health 2.0, which was um, often called international health, um, was comprised of clever people in rich countries doing something to help people in poor countries. And then kind of where we are today is somewhere between 3.0 and 4.0. So global health researchers from re rich countries leading research programs in poor countries. And then global health 4.0, which I think we've already started to hopefully um, move beyond that is where do we go um, from there? Next slide. All right, turning it over. And so, hi, everyone. Um, the, the list that we're about to go through, we're going to go through it fast. And again, we want to get to the discussion and give you guys a chance to talk in the end. And I think sharing of experiences is always the most important part. Um, but it's not an exhaustive list what we're going to go through. It's just a couple of examples to kind of help us see how the colonial structures um, and Western biases are still pretty present in the work that we all do today. And so we'll start off by um, something that I find really interesting. And again, so my lens is a little bit geared towards the humanitarian aid sector. So the reality is, is that we don't always measure the actual needs of populations, right? But we provide aid in some way. So this is an example of, you know, giving water bottles to an area that doesn't have water. But the thing is that we also don't always measure the impact of responses on population. And so this is, for example, this is actually a picture of Haiti. After the earthquake, there was no recycling system capable to deal with all the water bottles that were left from aid organizations. And so the other thing is that our global health governing bodies still very much are in the seats of power of formal colonial powers. And, you know, Europe is, you know, kind of remembered for being a colonial power, but the U.S. very quickly adapted onto this and has become a colonial power in its own right and used aid as foreign policy. And when we look at who gets to govern global health, global health bodies are neither diverse nor global. You know, a majority of the funding goes to high-income countries. The leaders of global health institutions are often men and people from high-income countries, and 51% of them alone are U.S. and U.K. nationals. And only 2.5% are actually nationals of low and income countries. When we consider who does the labor, the work, and the lived experience of global health, they only get a 2.5% representation stake. And so just to give, because we're all, you know, physicians, how does this play out in more recent times? You know, COVID is now a little bit of a distant memory for many of us, but we look at share of the population who at least had received one dose of the vaccine, and this is at the point when people were getting second and third doses, we can see very clearly that a lot of the colonial powers had access to the vaccine very quickly, but we left colonized areas without access to the vaccine. And I think some of this, you know, is pretty um, significant, but funding is kind of one of the ways in which the seats of power are held very much again in the global north. So funder-driven research agendas have been the case for many years, but the agendas are written or done or delegated on behalf of people in home, middle income countries, often with very little local input, expertise, and they're just kind of as afterthoughts and projects. But, you know, again, using my humanitarian lens, if you guys can put in the chat, because I'm going to ask a question. So, of um, and let's use a recent example of Ukraine. And I say that because I've been working in Ukraine for the last year and a half and actually going next week. Um, what percentage of all of the funding that went towards aid in Ukraine do we suspect went to the local NGOs or the local population? So just in the chat, give me some guesses. What percent of funding do we think actually at the end of the day? 28%, 10%, okay. 5%, 15%. Love it. So unfortunately, only 3% actually ended up in the hands of local civil society organizations. And it's kind of sad because Ukraine was thought to be, because of the dangers of the conflict, the difficulties of working on the ground, the fact that there's a lot of paranoia amongst sectors in Ukraine, so it's actually a very decentralized response. 
um, because there's a lot of concern of Russian involvement, there was a thought that this would be the first time where we actually saw a humanitarian response have a really locally led response. But at the end of the day, those local organizations only got about 3% of the funding. And if we actually zoom out, when we look at all of humanitarian aid dollars, about 3% is where we end on average for any response. And so, you know, we're all academic people for the most part, right? And so how do we do when we talk about authorship? And so um, Steph and I are a little, you know, this is something that we look at, and this is our area of research, but there was a great paper by Chris Rees and Michelle Asherenko that looked at, do we have parity or parasitism in global emergency pediatric literature? And the answer is that we don't. Very often in literature that comes out of low and middle income countries, the first and last authors are almost always high income country individuals. And there's a lot of barriers that also come to this. So publication and open access fees, I think we've all struggled when we get an open access fee of like in the thousands of dollars. And that's very often more than what many of our collaborators in low and middle income countries make in six months. And, you know, the language in which we write was often written in the language of deficit for people, not prescribing them with any agency, you know, always poor, always unable, lacking capacity, lacking initiative. And it's also, when we think about it, we often ask people to write in English or French, which is the language of the colonizers, and often many of our collaborators third or fourth language, and it's not their language of fluency. And I think the other thing is, again, the seats of power and who's in those seats of power. Only a third of editors from global health journals are actually based in low and middle income countries. The rest are actually in high income countries. And so we decided a couple of years ago through our um, decolonizing global emergency medicine working group to look at this. We're like, all right, so what does this actually look like for us, for adult emergency medicine? And are we, like all of us practice in low and middle income countries, so what does our authorship parity look like? Are we doing any better than the pediatric literature? Um, and the answer was, unfortunately, we're not. First author distribution was very highly concentrated in the US and the UK, and then other areas of Europe and Canada. Last authorship distribution was also similar. And so basically we found that high income country authors are almost always listed in first, second, and last authorship positions. So those positions of what is considered privilege. There are some things that were positive though. So having a local funding source, so not a high income country funding source or a US based funding source, and a smaller authorship group increased your odds of local first and last authorship. But we also found that, and I, cause I, I don't wanna, you know, bog you down with words is that the lower the country fell on the World Bank economic status, the less chance they had of having an author um, in a position, what's considered a position of privilege. And so I think the other thing and the question that we always think about is when we think about the knowledge generation that happens, that relies very heavily on the local expertise, the lived experience and the knowledge of our collaborators. But what is it about how we're doing our work that that knowledge co-production isn't often considered in a byline or to be named as a co-author? And so I think it's also important to um, think about education and education ourselves, right? And so very often global health for a long time was focused on problematic short-term mission experiences. And when we think about, are we causing more harm than good? And even looking at ourselves, our global health fellowships and degrees are often only available for high income country students and high income country learners. Also, you know, our low middle income country colleagues can't necessarily apply to these fellowships, but we often have numerous opportunities to go practice, to train, to teach in other countries, but they, we don't have that reciprocation for our colleagues in low and middle income countries. And there has been significant global health malpractice that has happened where people in low middle income countries with lower levels of training actually do things that they would be unsupervised in their home institution to do. And there's also a discrepancy of training levels where sometimes there's residents who go and teach people who have been general practitioners for years in their countries have been specialized for many, many years. And so I want to take a moment and I want you all to reflect on these images. And if you can just put in the chat your initial thoughts, what, what do we think when we see these images? Or you can also come off of you and just say what you think. Any initial thoughts on these images? 
I know I've been personally asked to um, allow photographs like this to be taken of me and used for fundraising. And right. so when, when I when I think about photographs like this, um, I am aware that they are effective um, at achieving dollars leaving people's wallets and being given to organizations. And I also am aware that they perpetuate a narrative and I personally feel really uncomfortable being in them. And as a uh, perceived as white, relatively thin, visibly able-bodied person, I am often asked to be in them because of how I look and, and the ways in which that may be appealing to a funder to have someone who looks like that in a scenario like the context in which these context, these photos show up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Malika mentioned that um, it could be, so a lot of white saviors and absolutely. So we have a happy, whiter appearing person kind of providing aid and holding a hand or holding a baby um, could be stock photos staged. So there's interesting arguments around this. So there are many organizations, MSF in particular, which says that these photos are important because we need to bear witness to atrocities. And there's definitely that argument to be made, but there are some people that directly actually make money off these photos. There was a recent controversy with some humanitarian organizations actually selling these photos. And also is the idea of consent. So we often have children in these photos and who's consenting on behalf of those children to take their photos. And if the reverse happened, if someone came to the U.S. and wanted to take a picture of a child, someone could get in serious trouble, potentially even be arrested for doing that. But it happens quite easily and quite people without even thinking in other parts of the world. And the question is, why is that? And so I'm going to hand it back over to Steph uh, to kind of go through just kind of what what does decolonizing mean and where do we go from here? Thanks so much. Um, and I just added something in the chat that, um, and this is new from like the last time, I think we've given one of these talks, Catalina, is that um, one of my colleagues actually just let me know about this, that some NGOs um, have even started because of this issue of like, um, you know, part of the kind of decolonized humanitarian aid movement has also kind of, people have tried to avoid taking pictures, um, have always been a little bit more um, concerned with like getting consent and, um, and then in certain instances, um, a consent from the people taking, uh, that you're taking pictures of, which, you know, you should always, um, always be doing. But, um, in one case, you might've heard of this Amnesty International started using AI generated images, um, for their like fundraising campaigns and for their, um, like, you know, reports. Um, and then basically this adds a whole new layer of bias where it kind of like melds these images of like, you know, darker skinned children together into like, it's, um, it's really scary. I had not been aware of this. Um, I can send like a link about this. I'm not sure. Like these, are, these are things that you're just kind of learning about every day that, um, you know, people I think didn't like are, have, may have good intentions, but there are so many new ways that bias can be kind of this, the structure of how ingrained colonialism is in our just our in human society as we know it today is so deep that um, even something like AI has so much bias um, and it is applicable to you know things like decolonizing global health. Um, so I'll just uh, go on to um, talk about how we can kind of use this in our own practice. So when we talk about decolonizing, we really aim to weed out any form of Western or colonial bias um, and approaches addressing the pervasive imbalance in power, representation, and resources, um, and deconstructing the ideologies of superiority and privilege of Western thought languages and um, language and approaches. And I also, you know, another thing is, um, I, I see that we have Western on here, but, you know, there's also examples of non-Western powers that also have practices that are very colonial. Um, you know, Catalina mentioned, you know, how the United States, you know, technically wasn't an imperial force, um, like the, the um, you know, the historically European forces. And now there are examples of other countries, um, China, um, other major um, economic global forces that are acting in very colonial ways. So just wanted to kind of point that out that um, it's not just, you know, Western, it's kind of this whole um, imbalanced power um, structure that can come from many different and come in many different forms. Often has a Western root in in the in how it's formed. Um, 
We really want to restore power and control to the colonized. And we also recognize that, you know, the leading academic voices are also the products of colonization ourselves. Next slide. So our aim is now to look inwards at our legacy of global health and question its persistence in our practices today and within ourselves um, and see how our work is possibly replicating the inequities of the past, um, which could lead to persistent inequities in the future. So what is the path forward? Um, we need change to drive to change the research agenda, who dominates authorship, who edits the research, um, who holds leadership position and who gets educated and how. And I'll just kind of take a, a sidebar just to talk about um, that one article that we um, worked on um, through SAEM, Global EM um, Academy, which I think a lot of you are you know, part of, um, but that's kind of how this kind of, um, Kelly and I kind of started a lot of this work. So that paper itself, you know, if you actually look at that, we actually got a couple of criticism and we were fully expecting this. You know, we had a absolutely wonderful, like it was really a beautiful, this organic experience of what we first just started with the question, like, let's look at how we we do as a, you know, in emergency medicine and global health, how do we do with our authorship? And we started off with a few people, then it expanded. We ended up having a whole group of, I think it was like 30 different authors most of whom, the majority of whom were not based in high income countries, the majority of whom were either residents or junior faculty, the majority of whom were women. And at the same time, I, like I, I, we tried so hard to have someone kind of lead the writing, um, have the time to, um, you know, like help with certain aspects of the manuscript. That was not one of us. And it was very hard to actually find those people that had the time um, people had so many other clinical responsibilities. People had um, a lack of confidence in their writing abilities when they actually turned out to be wonderful writers, but it was often, it was like the first manuscript many people had worked on. And we just realized that like, you know, our, our own authorship byline didn't look great. Like our last author, you know, was um, uh, Chris Reeves, who was very well published and he really led a lot of the work. We were very happy to have him be, you know, senior author. And then Gimbo, um, Hugh Hopper, Mugen Billy, and I split the first authorship because we thought that was very appropriate. But at the same time, like, why was it like like the second author, like the third author? Like, we would like to have all of those authors be, you know, non-US um, based and the last author as well. But it just pointed out that, you know, there is so much more than just looking at authorship that there's um, like the funding decisions also who... Um, you know, who has the protected time, you know, like I get some protected time to work on research that is non-existent for the vast majority of EM faculty that are not in high income countries. Um, there are not fellowships where you get dedicated time to work on your career. Um, so there are so many layers of, you know, this is, it was just very tip of the iceberg thing. Um, and it just kind of reinforced that, you know, all of these things that are on this slide here um, really need to change to try to, to just see something like change in where we assign authorship. Um, and I'll just briefly go over this because I want to get to discussion. So I think one of the main points that I've taken away from all of you know, these past few years of working on this is that so much of the change comes from you as an individual. Yes, a lot of the change is institutional. I mean, how do we change institutional practices of promotion? So one thing I'm working on at Brown is to work with our academic promotions committee for global health faculty, um, but also other faculty um, who are working on equity um, and inclusion work is, you know, the whole academic structure is kind of colonial in itself and in that, you know, first author and last author positions matter. And, um, but for global health work, if we really want to drive our, you know, anti-colonialism further, you know, we can't be putting ourselves in first and last author positions. Um, and we need to work with our promotions committees. We need to work with people to know that this work is going on um, and to kind of change, change some of the guidelines. Um, we also need to find ways that like our funding goes directly to the people that are actually doing the work, the, the local community leaders, the um, physicians who are directly treating the patients that we're, or that we want to find, you know, answer our research questions with um, and not have it get funneled through you know, gates to a U.S. institution, have it get funded, funneled through NIH or or the Wellcome Trust to uh, an institution in the U.K. or somewhere in Europe. Um, so these should go directly to to the people that are actually doing this work. And we're starting to see some of that change um, 
um, Gates Foundation and um, and NIH, for instance, have more grants going directly towards um, the uh, towards um, institutions in low middle income countries. But we're all part of a broken system. Doing good work in the field requires taking a critical eye to one's identity and how one can benefit from a system that oppresses so many others. So um, we don't have time for all of us to do the internal reflection right now, but um, just it, you know, take a minute to think about you know yourself, and just think on a for all of us. Um, we'll have a discussion. Think of a recent experience of yours. It can be the last experience, or maybe one that had um, an impact on how you think about your work. Um, and just think about what what. You know where where was there um, um, signs of you know de uh, of colonialism in your work? Where could there have been improvement? Um, what could we do to do better in your next project? Um, 